Guys, we're here with an anti-folk legend, in my opinion, uh, hailing from the Lower East Side of Manhattan. We have Jeffrey Lewis. Hello. Uh, first time in Grand Junction, Colorado. I've played in Denver many times, of course. I've uh, played in Fort Collins, but this is a new part of Colorado for me. Um, so you started your career. When would you say you started your career? Well, I started making up songs uh, late 97. I mean, I graduated from college in 97, and I just uh, you know, thought I was going to... Uh, hit the real world and start working some day jobs and start trying to make my comic book career get off the ground. And I was just living a very, you know, broke, starving artist lifestyle, not, you know, much of a social life. And I just started making up some songs at that time. So I was like 21. And at some point in 1998, I discovered that there was this open mic night at the Sidewalk Cafe, which was a place a couple blocks from my parents' apartment. And um, I started just hanging out at the Sidewalk Cafe all the time, and I still didn't really have any friends there. I would just be there with my sketchbook, just drawing, and I would always play at the open mic night, and I was playing these songs that I was making up. So I could, and I, I also recorded my first cassette of songs in that year, 98, so I was like selling my tape of songs at the Sidewalk Cafe for three bucks, and I could say that was the start of my career, but I didn't really start like touring and doing music more full time until like 2002. Mm. But between 1998 and 2002, I was doing a lot of music and sort of learning how to play shows and writing songs, playing music with my brother Jack a lot and recording cassettes of my songs quite a lot. But I didn't really start to learn how to book tours and start playing more shows in front of people and stuff until like 2001, 2002. Right, your, uh, your debut um, the last time I took acid, I went insane, came out 2001. Um, would you say you picked up on a lot of musical inf influences from people around you, artists from the area? A hundred percent. And that's, uh, I was very lucky to be um, at a place like the Sidewalk Cafe where I could see a whole, it was free to get in every night. And... I would just hang out there. I had nothing else to do. I had no money, and I would just see so many artists performing, all these little New York City uh, artists, um, you know, most of whom never really went anywhere, but a lot of these people had a big influence on me, uh, especially when I was first starting out, and also just seeing so many performers and so, so many open, open mic nights. I still try to go to an open mic night once a week because I feel like I always pick up on something. There's maybe some unexpected surprise, right. somebody that... I've never seen before, I might never see again. But there's also a lot of things where you learn just what not to do, seeing right. all these performers and um, sort of realizing like, oh, it, like, you know, it's not cool when I do that thing. You know, if mm -hmm. I see somebody else doing something that I was doing and I was like, oh, it doesn't actually come across that well, I should stop doing right. that. So that was educational. But in terms of like influences on the music that I was making, I mean, Daniel Johnston is just my absolute like Lodestone, North Star, um, the most important influence right. beyond everything else. And I wouldn't have been making songs without Daniel Johnston. I wouldn't have been recording, recording my songs without Daniel Johnston. The idea that you could just make songs, record them onto cassettes. That album that you mentioned, which was like my first official album that came out in 2001, mm -hmm. that was like the first CD. But the cassettes, I had done maybe four or five cassettes right. of my songs before that. And that album was essentially just songs that I had selected from those cassettes and put on that record. So some of those songs I'd already been playing for a few years. Right. But uh, yeah, Daniel Johnston is the most important songwriter and just creative uh, guiding presence to me. To this day, I feel like any time I listen to Daniel Johnston, I'm just like, oh, that, that's a reminder of what it's all about. Right. But then, you know, I was just learning how to play guitar at that time. So the influences, which I think are, to my ear, I hear them throughout all of those songs that I was making up. Um, Donovan was a really big influence. Mm -hmm. I was listening to a lot of Donovan records, a lot of early acoustic Donovan records, especially. Um, albums like Fairy Tale and Catch the Wind and Four Little Ones and a lot of 
my guitar playing, the finger picking and the chords and stuff, I was learning from those Donovan records. And uh, there was a folk band, a 60s psychedelic folk band called Pearls Before Swine that I was listening to quite a lot at that time also. And Pearls Before Swine was a really big influence on, yeah, the kinds of finger picking and chords. Um, and then, you know, other influences, I started to, I was always into like 60s rock quite a lot, but I started to get much more heavily into the like Pebbles series of psychedelic and garage rock right. weird obscurities. Right. Um, like there's the Nuggets compilation, but that's sort of like the more well-known obscurities. And that's, that's what coined punk rock, right? Yeah, nu the Nuggets compilation that came out in 1972 had a lot of garage rock stuff on it that was, you know, maybe some of the more well-known garage rock bands which were still sort of obscure, but stuff like the 13th Floor Elevators and the Kingsman's recording of Louie Louie, stuff that, you know, was like very raw and um, stuff that in the early 70s, some people were calling punk rock, right. as, um, even though it's different than what we now think of as punk rock. But getting into that kind of stuff, that part of the 60s sound, also had a really big impact on my music in uh, the stuff I was making with my brother. My brother mm -hmm. Jack was playing bass. And we first started playing with a drummer in 2002. And that very basic kind of rock and roll that I was getting really into from the garage rock stuff really impacted the idea that we could make, you know, really fun, exciting rock and roll that was fun to play and really, you know, was really rocking because I was listening to tons of those Pebbles compilations. I was just buying them on LP every time I saw them. And then the Back from the Grave compilations. Mm -hmm. And bands like uh, Beat Happening, I started to get really into Beat Happening. Um, that's like early 80s, mid-late mid 80s, Olympia, Washington stuff that was like, you know, rock, but very simple and raw. Um, and uh, then when I discovered The Fall, I started to get really into The Fall, who I happened to be wearing a shirt of that, um, a handmade shirt somebody awesome. gave me. The Fall had a really big influence on me. And actually, The Fall were also very influenced by that 60s psychedelic and garage rock mm -hmm. stuff. So all of that style of what rock was, was um, kind of, as my brother and I started playing with a drummer more, right. that became more of a, a, a part of the music in addition to just the more kind of Donovan-esque, uh, very simple acoustic folk songs. And then a huge influence was a New York City band called Pre-War Yard Sale, who never got very well known outside of that little anti-folk scene in New York. But they yeah. were just a huge uh, thing for me. I just became a huge fan. I, I like interviewed the main guy, Mike Reckner, for a fanzine. And I also wrote a very long like 10-page review of their first album when that came out in like 2001. And they had a very simple style where almost every song was like two chords or three chords, mm -hmm. just the mo but like very weird lyrics. And Mike Reckner, the main guy in that band, it was just Mike and his wife, Dina, as a duo. And Mike would use a distortion pedal with his acoustic guitar. And he would just kind of step on the distortion and step it off within each song at different dramatic parts of the song. Right. And that just basically, I just swiped his whole style. I mean, he has told me that he doesn't like hearing me say that because it embarrasses him. He's like, don't say you took my style. Come on, don't even mention me. But, but, but it's, it's completely true. I, I would not have, that was the entire reason that I bought a distortion pedal. It's why I got a pickup in the guitar. I just wanted to have the exact same gear that Mike Reckner had because right. his stuff just blew me away and it still blows me away. I, uh, I put on those recordings and I'm just like, I just love it. So pre-war yard sale had a huge influence on my sound for sure. Yeah, um, you know you have such a vast knowledge of music, like incredible music knowledge, but you also have just this intense connection to the like comic sphere. Um, you did your senior literary literary um, I can't think of the word uh, thesis or thesis paper or on whatever paper on uh, Watchmen. Um, and later gave a speech about it, or uh, um, 
Well, I was actually doing my a lecture about Watchmen, lecture, which right. basically goes into some of the ideas and that I had in my in my literary uh, senior thesis at college because I was a literature major in college and. So I kept continually like expanding on these ideas about Watchmen and what I think the symbolism means and all this stuff. So I've done a lot of these uh, sort of lectures on Watchmen where people just come and I sort of have a projector and I'm showing different panels from the comic and I'm mm -hmm. like, if you, if you look at this, what I think it means is blah, 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 blah. And I actually have just now, uh, just this week, finally published a book, which is basically my complete analysis of Watchmen in book okay. form. I have two copies on the merch table. I, I just grabbed, a, I just got the boxes before I left for this tour, right. so I didn't have a chance to ship any of them out. My luggage was already full. I just basically grabbed a handful of these books uh, before I left uh, from New York City to come out for this tour uh, yesterday, actually. So I only have two copies left on the table, but um, you can take a look at that, and that's my, uh, my whole, my whole, uh, critique of Watchmen in one book form. So I'm really excited to finally have that That's in print. amazing. My, uh, my cameraman, who couldn't be here with us today, that's what he told me to ask about. And uh, he told me to ask you what your favorite part of Watchmen is, just like anything about it. Oh, man. Well, I, I've gone so far off the deep end into deep reading of it that I'm like, uh, I don't know if the things I'm seeing in it are even there or just my own psychotic hallucinations of what I think is in there, but it's so dense and it's so rich with information right. that it, it really plays into the idea that you can come up with these weird interpretations Yeah, because there's just so much information in every panel and it's so deliberately done. If I had to pick one thing about Watchmen to just say at the moment, it's not something that I even knew about for years. Even when I was like deeply into Watchmen, I didn't know about this, but chapter five is constructed completely symmetrically. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I can't think of any achievement in the history of comic books that is close to the level of sophistication and artistry that must have gone into creating that one issue. Right. And I imagine that most people would never even notice, yeah. but every single, because that issue is, focused on the character Rorschach, whose whole thing is about symmetry and extreme like black and white uh, morality of right and wrong and these like symmetrical divisions of things. And the whole issue is constructed where the first panel shows, you know, like Rorschach below this building looking up and then the final panel of the issue is like from the building like looking down and it's like Rorschach in the street. And then like the second panel of the issue is you know, maybe it's like Dan and Lori having a discussion while eating, and the second to last panel is like them like having a discussion while eating. Or so it's it's basically constructed hmm. in a way where you're just reading the story and you have no idea that the whole. And then it sort of leads to a very important moment right in the center fold of that issue. But there's so much going on, and there's so many layers in everything that the fact that they were able to bake all of that in plus create this issue in a symmetrical way is just off the charts in terms of accomplishment in the comic book form. And it's, I don't think, I mean, Watchmen is ancient now. It's 1986, which mm. is forever ago. Right. And I don't think anybody's come close to making a comic book on that yeah, level. That's, I had no idea. That's crazy. It's unbelievable. I mean, yeah. if you read that issue, chapter five, it, it is just mind blowing. You, you just can't even believe it's right. like, at the highest level of artistry of anything right. ever. It's like, wow. did the Beatles do anything that great? Like, it's just so freaking weird. It's like, did Michael Jackson do anything that great? Like, who are the greatest art, you know, did Da Vinci do anything that great? It's like, it's at a level where you're like, this is just hardcore. This is like beyond the beyond. Like, how did they do this? Mm -hmm. Plus it's just super entertaining. It's yeah. like, you're just sucked into the story, so yeah. you don't even realize all this other stuff going yeah. on. Wow, that's crazy. You. Uh... You're a comic artist yourself. Um, tell me a little bit about that. Tell me some of your influences, what you write about, because there is quite a variety, I feel like. Well, my comic books started out, you know, I was into comic books my whole life. My, my parents were kind of, you know, countercultural hippie types, so, so very anti-television. Um, so we didn't have any TV in the house when I was growing up. And comic books were kind of my... TV, that was my form of entertainment from 
even really before I could read. I was just, there was always comic books for me as a thing to just keep me busy as a kid. And so from, you know, the earliest years of being into the most basic stuff, Superman, Spider-Man, uh, Rom Space Knight was, one, was, you know, my favorite character, a Marvel character. But I read everything, you know, anything, you know, it was like, a f and comic books in those days, and this, I'm talking like early 80s when I was growing up, they were much more widespread in terms of like, their comic book stores weren't mm. really as much of a thing yet. Right. So comic books themselves existed in all these other places where a little kid going around with his mom, you know, maybe my mom needed to go to the pharmacy right. and there's comic books there in the pharmacy. Right. And I'm like, please, can I get this right. Ghost Rider issue? Like, maybe she has the extra 50 cents for it or not. Yeah. But they were just everywhere, you know, and um, parents would be getting... Uh, you know, a newspaper from a newsstand, and if they go to the magazine store or the newsstand to get the latest New York Times or something, there's comic books there. And I'm right. like, can I get this issue of the Hulk or whatever? You know, you would just get whatever yeah. they had. And if, you know, it was like asking your parents if you could get a, a candy bar or something, but it, it wasn't bad for you. It was right. actually, it, they encouraged it in the right. sense of like, it kept me busy, it kept me out of trouble. You're reading. And I was reading. Right. So it was you know, always an easier sell than asking for, like, ice cream or something. Right. And they were very cheap. And also, there were tons of comics at, like, probably, maybe even till to this day, at, like, garage sales and stuff, mm -hmm. or people would be selling them on the street. Mm -hmm. Just, like, walking around New York City, and there would be, you know, essentially homeless people, but not necessarily even homeless people, just people selling stuff on the street. Right. And they might have some weird junk, and they would always have comic books. Yeah. So... They were just everywhere, and mm. if you were just walking around with your mom or dad, you could always just be like, oh, please, can I get this comic? Right. So the comics that I wanted to make when I started being interested in making my own comics were like the comics that I was reading, which was a lot of Marvel stuff, very basic superhero stuff. Um, but I started to get into just more and more different kinds of comics, uh, some independent stuff, some black and white stuff. The most exciting thing in the world for about a year was the original black and white Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comic before yeah. it became a mainstream phenomenon when it was this kind of underground cult sensation in the comic book world. Mm -hmm. If you were into Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you were like the coolest of the cool because right. it was like this black and white comic. It had everything that was freaking cool because <laughs> like ninjas were the most awesome thing. Mutants were the most awesome thing. Yeah. And it was just, it had this different flavor than anything else that was out there. So I did five issues that I drew and wrote when I was about 11, maybe, of, uh, I had a, a Ninja Turtles ripoff comic called uh, Humanoid Atomic Samurai Squirrels. And I drew an entire five issues of that series. That was like my first real, really dedicated comic book work where, when mm -hmm. I was making those. But as, you know, as time went on, I got into more and more stuff, Alan Moore stuff, Frank Miller. And then in the 90s, all the alternative comics in the 90s, um, by the late 90s, I was just very into stuff like uh, Eight Ball by Daniel Klaus, which had the Ghost World story in it, which later became a movie, and um, Peep Show by Joe Matt. And a lot of that had such a big influence on the comics that I wanted to make mm -hmm. that it really steered me in that direction. Um, so that's the kind of comics I'm still making now, or kind of like a 90s style right. alternative comic yeah, definitely reflects in your art i think uh, i was doing research and a comic panel popped up called bearded you know it starts with a guy who's got a measly you know bald spot and evolves into the whole page just being covered with hair and i think that's just so so simple so genius yeah that was a silly uh th i don't know why that ended up on it's on my wikipedia page i'm like somebody put that on there as an example it's like a very weird obscure one page it was a magazine called bearded and they had me do the cover for one of their issues, and that was the cover that I drew, was this little comic, this like maybe five or six panel comic, and for some reason that has ended up on my Wikipedia page, even though never, obviously nobody's ever heard of Bearded Magazine. Um, but yeah, I'm still trying to make my comics. I try to come out with one issue a year at this point if I can. It's very hard to work on them because in the sense of like spending so much time touring and right. so much time organizing the music stuff, working on the music stuff. 
but I still I'm very dedicated to keeping up on my comic book work if I right. can. Um, you know, kind of on the spot question, but I need those top five favorite comics. Okay, top five. And okay, you mean single issues or no, whole I mean, series okay. kind of thing? You can nerd out. You can say specific issues, but I just need to know your favorites. Okay, well. I would say Eight Ball as a series by Daniel Klaus, which went from like, I think issue one came out in 1989 or maybe 1990. Um, and he basically stopped making Eight Ball around 2003. I think the last issue was maybe number 23 or something. But that, I think, is the greatest comic series of all time. I still hold that in the highest regard because it's just, it's basically what I've been ripping off of ever since. It's like every issue has these different short stories in it. It's so off the wall, and you don't really know what the next issue is going to bring, and the different stories are in different styles. And he just gets better and better and better in every issue. And you just see that this guy is so dedicated to creating this art and these stories that his development, by the time it gets to around issue 12 or 13, you just start being so blown away that, like, how did this get here? It started out so silly, and now it's like very serious, and right. now it's like really moving. I'm like, I, this was just like some quirky, weird thing, and then suddenly you're like, your heartstrings are being yanked, and then like, it's just so crazy and berserk, and and then the next issue, you're just like, what? What is he doing now? So that that experience of reading those issues and just following that development was so great. So, and. Uh, Joe Matt's Peep Show, which was an autobiographical comic that was coming out in the 90s into early 2000s, that would also be one of my favorites. And that really opened my eyes to the kind of autobiographical comic book mm -hmm. world, which actually was a really big influence on my songwriting, too. This idea that like everything that was embarrassing or not cool about yourself could actually be, if you kind of own it and center it in a certain way, you didn't have to like shy away from it and in fact there was like a a real entertainment value in all of your own flaws right and i really the peep show comic really kind of showed that to me and it was so funny and so messed up and like thousands of people do autobiographical comics because right. it's so easy because right. you don't have to think of any stories you're just yeah. like write whatever happened to yeah. you but something about the way joe matt's comics functioned was just so much funnier and better and his life was just so messed up like him as a character was just so messed up like that stuff is just so addictive and that yeah I would say that's one of my favorites in terms of like uh, well of course you know Alan Moore goes without saying like greatest comic writer of all right. time so if I had to pick an Alan Moore comic I mean you know, I guess Watchmen is considered his like masterpiece, but right. there's so many others. I love all his Swamp Thing issues, yeah. um, V for Vendetta. Uh, he's uh, he's got so many highlights in his career that it's very hard to pick just one. And there's certain things that I like better than Watchmen in different ways. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean the the work of Alan Moore, and particularly like. You know, I guess I could say Watchmen as his sort of biggest technical achievement. And then, uh, yeah, I don't even know how many that's up to. But, you know, Marvel stuff, I guess I would say, like old Stan Lee and Jack Kirby stuff, yeah. like uh, the, the original Coming of Galactus story in oh, yeah. Fantastic Four with the, with the Silver Surfer. And that is like a great example of the kind of, complete mind-blowing magic of those Stan Lee, Jack Kirby Yeah, and I mean, those Jack comics. Kirby, like, I mean, the thing, that is a reflection of, like, that is just some incredible comic writing that yeah. shows how personal a story can be. Yeah, it's so, and it's just so addictive. The personality that comes out from it is, right. like, it's, uh, yeah, it still holds up. And it's, yeah. even though they're, like, very dinky and, like, kind of half-assed in a certain way because they were just cranking these things Five out. colors. But, yeah, yeah. Um, but they're just, they have a certain charm that, and, um, and they often are very psychedelic and weird yeah. and yeah, yeah. Th that's great stuff. So that's, that's some comics. I'm sure I'm forgetting stuff and I'm going to be like, oh, I should have said something. Um, I have one kind of last big question. Um, in your, I'd say one of your biggest projects, to me at least, it's one of my favorites. It came out earlier this year. Um, the develop, you might have to help me with the title, the, the developing history of 
punk rock in uh, uh, what am I missing? It's um, a long, cumbersome yeah. title. Uh, when I play it with my band, if we're gonna do it in a live mm -hmm. show, if I write it on a set list, I just say punk history right. as a shortened version of the title. But the complete title I think of as uh, like, what, what would I say? Like the complete history of the development of punk rock on the Lower East Side of New York City from 1950 to 1975. It's, so I think it's 72. Long... Uh, well, it's somewhere it's well, 72. Well, it's um, technically I start in 1952. Mm. Um, but yeah, something like that, whatever. I mean, it, the title has morphed a little bit over, over time. Well, I, I, yeah, I think it's on Spotify as the, I don't think I say the complete history. Maybe I just say the history of the development of punk on the Lower East Side. Or maybe I just say the history, the development of punk. I don't know. It's... The title has been variable over the years, but that's right. the idea. Um, and actually, I wrote that. I first started performing that in 2004. It's just taken a long time to put out a released right. version of it. I, you know, I was playing it live since 2004, and it actually used to. I used to have a. Uh, there would be a CD of it that came with the first issue of my old comic book. Oh, really? Um, because I was a little scared of putting it out in an official sellable form because I didn't know if I would have to pay royalties on all the songs that right. I mentioned in the, you know, because I'm performing excerpts of all these yeah. songs through the 60s and 70s. So I was a little worried about putting that on. I actually recorded a version of it that was going to go on the City and Eastern Songs album that I put out in 2005, mm -hmm. but I left it off the album because I was a little worried about the legality of like right. performing all those bits of songs written by other people. So the way that I did release it back in those days was that if you bought my comic book, it came with a little free CD. Oh, wow. So I could be like, okay, you're, it's, this, it's free. Right. It was sort of like a little gimmick. It was yeah. like, uh, this way I could, if anybody ever said like, uh, that's not legal, I could be like, well, it's free. I'm not selling it. It's like, it just comes free with the comic. Yeah. Um, but I was researching like, co releasing cover songs on Spotify or excerpts that, it seemed like it would be fine to release it on streaming in this mm -hmm. current era, so, yeah. Um, well, in it, around halfway through, you talk about the divide in the 60s and early 70s with that alternative East Coast scene, which was, you know, drugs and sex and rock and roll, and it divided into a more hippy-dippy, psychedelic kind of scene on the West Coast, where where was that divide? What happened? What caused that, that shift? Well, um, Dylan going electric in 65 seems to me like the moment when people stopped paying attention to New York City because mm -hmm. prior to 65, um, the folk scene in New York City, all the acoustic folky type people, like Bob Dylan and Phil Oaks and Tom Paxton, uh, this whole songwriting scene um, was, as soon as Dylan went electric, all of that was considered very uncool and like rock and roll and um, folk rock was this new thing. So right. inspired by this like, new concept of folk rock, where it's like folk sort of music played now on Beatles-esque rock instruments, and the Birds were one of the first bands to really capitalize on that. So mm -hmm. the Birds are a West Coast band. And the success of the Birds in 1965, when they're starting to use, you know, they're doing electric instrument versions of not only Dylan songs, but like Pete Seeger and other folk songs. Mm -hmm. So this just becomes this successful phenomenon based on the West Coast, essentially because the Birds come out of the West Coast. Right. And so the bands that start to spring up inspired by the birds, um, where you've got Buffalo Springfield and say Moby Grape and Love and the, the sort of early West Coast folk rock, mm -hmm. which is kind of trending into psychedelic also. And the Great Society who were sort of like a, you know, somewhat morphed into Jefferson Airplane. And the, and the early Jefferson Airplane, which was also very folk rock and kind of inspired by the birds. And, um, and then, you know, the Grateful Dead and those sorts of West Coast bands, Country Joe and the Fish, were kind of part of this um, 
folk rock and then into psychedelic rock thing. And mm -hmm. all the record labels were kind of, because of the success of the Birds and these other bands, they were kind of just this, this kind of feeding frenzy of signing all these West Coast bands. While meanwhile, New York City just became so kind of not cool or, or not commercially successful mm -hmm. because the bands that were in New York City that were starting to become electric and like, like the Velvet Underground had started out acoustic, but then Dylan goes electric and the Velvet Underground start playing electric later yeah. in 65 also. But they're completely uncommercial. They're just yeah. like, the recordings are so raw. There's no real way that that stuff could be sold. It's not going to be on the radio. It just sounds lo-fi. Yeah. And then all these other New York City bands that are just too, far too weird to have any commercial potential. I mean, the gods and the fugs, and they're not even trying to be commercial. They're just no. making crazy music, yeah. which is why I think of that as like part of the punk right. ethos of like, it's not about being technically proficient. It's just like very, uh, you know, and then even weird stuff like Silver Apples, which is like electronic, -y, you know, they're building these weird electronic music making devices and um, Lothar and the Hand People was also coming out of New York City um, and just weird stuff that not only didn't have much chance of being commercial, but seemed to not care about being commercial. Right. It just seemed to thumb its nose at the very idea of making a sound that was commercially acceptable. Right. And so therefore it wasn't really noticed during, at the time. Yeah. Um, I don't know who was buying those records at the time. I was like, right. somebody was buying those records. Somebody was. But what they thought of those, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it's, I'm very curious about that. Like, who was buying those records in 67, 68, 69? Like, it's not like those albums sold nothing. They weren't big, but they, they, they you know, uh, they were bought by somebody, and those bands were playing gigs and stuff. Somebody was into it. Yeah. But it wasn't until the CBGB scene that, like, now New York City's cool again. It has the Ramones. It yeah. has, you know, this, this idea that, like, oh, there's a rock and roll movement coming out of New York City starting from, like, 1975 onward. Mm -hmm. But I was just fascinated by that whole period from 65 to 75, essentially, like, when nobody was paying attention to New York City. Like, what was going on in New York City musically in that time was, like, a, a fascinating topic to me. Yeah. Um, you know, you talk about the difference in between that hippie scene and that, you know, anti-folk, early punk rock. And I feel like that, you know, reflects you a little bit with, you know, growing up a little more untraditional, a little hippie-esque and having the song, you know, I saw a hippie girl where you talk about how, you know, you used to be, you know, you just don't show, you don't need the, uh, the clothes to show off that identity. Would you say like that, that rift does reflect upon you? Well, for me, I mean, I get, you know, everybody's journey in life is like different mm -hmm. and uh, everybody sort of comes to their own sense of their own identity in whatever way and with the music that they happen to discover. I mean, perhaps if I had had a different group of friends when I was 13, 14, yeah. maybe I would have, maybe somebody would have played me some goth stuff and I would have gotten into right. it or some, you know, or maybe heavy metal or rap or something, but for whatever reason, uh, rock and roll and 60s rock and roll just first caught my ear when I first started getting interested in music when I was 12, 13, 14. The Rolling Stones, The Beatles, Dylan, Hendrix, Grateful mm -hmm. Dead, that just was the stuff that was the most exciting to me and that right. became the you know, as you start sort of constructing an identity in your teenage years and like, are you going to be a punk? Are you going to be a hippie? Are you going to be, you know, whatever it is, whatever the options are of the, the tribal identities, uh, that 60s hippie thing was just, I was just all about it. And I um, had a very different sense of it than most of my friends because I really got scared off of doing the drugs after a very short time. I was really mm. only smoking pot for like one year um, maybe two years and uh, trying acid and mushrooms and stuff for a very short period, just a few months. And it just was so unpleasant for me. I was mm -hmm. not having fun. I was like, my friends were having fun, but I was just like, just having these very depressing and dark thoughts and just, right. um, 
you know, all my, ex my experiences at, in my teenage years were just like, these drugs are not fun for me. I'm yeah. just not having a good time. So I stopped doing that stuff. So I was a very weird hippie in the sense that like people would look at me and be like, okay, I have long hair. I'd be wearing like a Grateful Dead shirt. And uh, I was very much part of that tribe. And I was really into psychedelic records. I, you know, I loved listening to all that stuff, all yeah. Jefferson Airplane and you know, Cream and all these records. I just was eating up all that stuff. I just couldn't get enough of it. And posters, you know, I would, if you saw my bedroom, it was like, you know, here's my, my uh, whatever, my Doors poster, my Grateful Dead stuff. I was going to Dead shows. But I wasn't smoking pot and I wasn't doing acid or anything. I was right. just not doing anything. So it was like I didn't even really fit in. Like all my friends would be like, hey, yeah, you know, we're all going to hang out and smoke pot. And I was just like, no, you know. So I was like very yeah. much kind of like, on one hand, deeper into the music, I was buying these records and I was just so curious to learn more about all that stuff and reading these books. But I was like not doing the drugs that were associated with that. So yeah. I was kind of a, an outsider to a lot of the experience that, that the rest of that scene was having and people just thought I was weird. And then uh, when I was in college, I ended up making friends with like this big skinhead guy, Ezra, who was my, room, my college roommate. And he introduced me to so much stuff that I had never, we introduced each other to a lot of stuff right. that we would ordinarily never have encountered because right. we're stuck living in this dorm room together. Yeah. And the first day of college, we're like, oh my God, I can't, we're both like, I can't believe we're stuck in a dorm room with this guy because he's like this big, scary skinhead guy. And I'm like this little skinny, long haired hippie guy. <laughs> and we're just like, this is the most mad. Like, we were just like, this is going to be a, you know, it just, yeah. I think both of us were just not happy about being stuck in a dorm room together. Right. But we became great friends somehow. And we introduced each other to so much stuff. Yeah. I mean, that was the first time I heard Crass and uh, Dead Kennedys and all this like punk stuff that he was into, in addition to a lot of like ska mm. and skinhead stuff, a lot of like more hardcore stuff and um, stuff that was like, I'd never heard anything like that. And he was, you know, I was playing him like Sid Barrett, early Pink Floyd, and like mm -hmm. just, you know, we both got really into Ween together. So that was very eye opening for both of us. Right. And I think he had a, a really huge influence on me. That, being forced into contact with a totally different musical realm just opened my eyes to a lot of stuff that if I had just been hanging out with other hippie types and just smoking pot, I feel like I would have missed out on being forced to have this other experience. Right. Wow, that's crazy. That's a, an amazing story. Um, I, uh, I guess I have two more little questions. I guess uh, I, need a, I need a music recommendation from you. Oh, well, uh, gosh, there's many, but um, music, well, you know, I, I guess uh, I was saying pre-war yard sale earlier. Um, you can find these pre-war yard sale recordings um, on Bandcamp and on Spotify. Their first album is called Lowdown. Okay. And if you, if you listen to pre-war yard sales album Lowdown, a lot of their earlier stuff, Mike Reckner's earlier stuff before they were calling themselves pre-war yard sale when it was just Mike Reckner, that stuff, I think, is not on Spotify or Bandcamp. And I, I really, that stuff really influenced me a lot, too. But that first pre-war yard sale record, I feel like if you listen to that, I, I love that record very much. And um, it's called Lowdown. It's from 2001, I think. And if you listen to that, you might see what I'm talking about in terms of like, oh, this is where Jeffrey got a certain right. amount of his style from. Right. Well, what can the people expect from you in the upcoming? Anything? I'm working on so much stuff. I'm always working on so much stuff. I'm trying to get my new, I'm working on my new comic book issue. I just printed my Watchmen book. I'm really excited right. about that. I haven't really released it yet. I haven't yeah. announced it or anything because I just got the books before I left for this tour. So when I come home from this tour, I'll figure out some kind of, what do I want to do? Do I want to get this in comic stores? Do I want to sell it from my website? Do I want to find a distributor? I need to make some kind of plan. But mm -hmm. the, the Watchmen book is huge for me. I've been working on that for so many years that that's a, to complete that project this year is big for me. I'm, uh, I'm in this like lawsuit against, uh, not really a lawsuit, I don't even know. I'm like, I'm trying to figure out what to do with this, uh, this pop star, Sabrina Carpenter, who took a piece of my artwork and has been using it on her own merchandise really? without crediting me. And she's pretty huge. I mean, she's played on Saturday Night Live. She's like, you know, she was opening for Taylor Swift and now she's headlining her own giant shows. So she's like a regular pop star and I hear her songs every time, you know, if I go into a cafe or something. 
And somebody had sent me a picture on Instagram that was like, do you know that Sabrina Carpenter is selling these shirts and these sweaters and other mm. things that have your drawing on them? And um, I guess she found it on the internet or somebody in her team. So a friend of mine is a lawyer and he sort of gave me some advice on what to do next. And so now I'm talking to these other people. So that's, you know, I'm dealing with that. I don't really know what to do about that. So I'm doing, I'm sort of looking into that. I have my new album with my band that we recorded. I, I don't know when that's going to be released. I'm talking to some different record labels and figuring out a plan with that. Uh, UK tour in September, a big USA tour in October. So there's a lot of work that goes into that. I have to make the poster and mail the posters out. I have to figure out where the band is sleeping every night. We got, there's, there's just like a, a lot right. of stuff that's going to, that, that's a big undertaking. Um, I just did an illustration job for uh, Adam Green from The Moldy Peaches. He's releasing a DVD of this movie that he made. He's been making movies the last few years. Very mm. weird, completely off the wall, brilliant, <laughs> surreal film. So the movie uh, Adam Green's Aladdin, okay. um, he's doing a DVD release of that. So okay. um, it's just like a freelance illustration job for me to draw the cover of the DVD, the cover on the back cover. So I just finished that artwork and sent it to them. Um, so yeah, there's just like a lot of stuff, always a lot of different stuff. Keeps me busy. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I really appreciate it. So. Well, I hope the recording can, you know, I feel like a, you know, half the time I do these things, we have Hopefully a nice conversation and then it's like nobody hit record or no, the battery's I'm dead or something. I like That's, fucked up. Like I've been yeah. thinking about it this whole time, but yeah, yeah. So thank you so much. Well, all right. I'm going to unclip. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs>